but our constitution is a federal constitution, which reserves a good deal of power to the states. Incidentally, contemporarily speaking, uh, all of you, not all who may be lawyers, but all of you know that uh, the jurisprudence of the current court has often dealt with the question of federalism. And what the most recent votes have shown when it involved the issue of where the power should lie, federal government or the states, in a good many instances, by five to four votes, this court has found that the states deserve more recognition in certain areas and under certain conditions than does the national government. That doesn't mean the national government doesn't have any power. It has tremendous power. But what it means is that this court has recognized the fact that the uh, Constitution was based on a federalist component and that the state should not be denuded of all authority. So um, that's how the circle comes around. In any event, uh, Jackson uh, was not on the court long enough, probably, to be included as great among the first nine or 12. I chose nine and most other people chose 12. That was the limit. But he's always been recognized as a major figure. And one of the main reasons, in addition to the fact that he wasn't on the court long enough, really, was that he had a very public uh, role, a very public enmity with Justice Black. Justice Black, who was, of course, one of the senior justices, was very unhappy with the fact that Justice Jackson allowed himself to be absented from the court for an entire year. That caused problems in the decision-making process. There were a good many four to four ties, and Black, who was not the Chief Justice during that period, nevertheless was a senior one, and he was very unhappy with the fact that Jackson was absent so much. Moreover, President Roosevelt, although it's been denied, uh, I would not deny it, uh, President Roosevelt had apparently promised the Chief Justiceship to both Jackson and to Black, and to a few others, I might say. <laughs> Um, that was one of the characteristics of FDR, you know, who was, who was one of our great presidents, but he was also, he could also be a little schemer. Anyway, uh, neither Black nor Jackson got the uh, uh, chief justiceship at the time. I went to Stone during that period, and he was followed by Vinson. But uh, they blamed one another for not getting the chief justiceship and, and blamed the president to some extent. Uh, furthermore, uh, Jackson's uh, time at Nuremberg, of course, uh, caused a number of stormy concepts. Uh, he was a, a major figure at Nuremberg. He was largely responsible for the recognition of an international framework of law. He helped to write the concept of crimes against humanity and crimes of war, a concept which is very, very much in vogue at the present time. And you, if you heard President Bush the other evening, he spoke of the concept of personal responsibility for participating in war, not merely an excuse to say they did it and we only came along. Uh, Jackson um, uh, had major influence on the court in a good many ways. And that influence was punctuated and highlighted by his pen. There is no one, with the possible exception of Justice Cardozo, who wrote as beautifully and as magnificently and as facilely as did Robert Jackson. His pen sang, his prose was superb, and he gave life to certain cases merely through the work of his pen. Uh, among, among the booklets which uh, you have issued is a compendium of some, some of his finest assertions, and they sound like music in a good many ways. I quoted several last night, and one of those as I always remember is he was, he wrote a majority opinion in striking down a West Virginia requirement that students um, had to salute the flag in class, even if that went against their own religious convictions. These students who were involved happened to be Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were told by their parents, you cannot salute the flag. Well, they were disciplined, and the case came to the Supreme Court. In an earlier case, during wartime, in an opinion written by Justice Frankfurter, the court had held, yes, you must, you must consider the fact that this is wartime, and consequently, you have to bow to uh, the concept of uh, participation. Well, that was overturned in a major opinion two years later, coming out of West Virginia by Justice Jackson. He voted, and he overturned the Frankfurter earlier opinion. And 
one of the things he said is that those who begin coercive elimination of dissent will soon find themselves eliminating dissenters. Compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. And that is an example of his pen. And his pen is as it sang and spoke. And he will be remembered for his, <coughs> for his ability to write, much more so than for some of the other opinions. He, was also, he also will be remembered. He was one of three justices who dissented from the famous or infamous opinion in Korematsu versus the United States in which the Japanese evacuation was upheld by the court in the six to three opinion written by Justice Jackson's nemesis, Justice Black, who was one of the leading liberals on the bench, but who felt that during wartime, the court could not superimpose its judgment upon that of the chief executive who had been given permission by Congress to um, uh, clear and to, and to uh, uh, secure the West Coast. Uh, Jackson dissented in the case in a brilliant opinion, but it was in dissent. And he pointed out that uh, people who have, have certain um, characteristics of race or color cannot escape from that. Moreover, he wrote that guilt is personal and cannot be acquired merely by membership in a certain race. Um, when he went to Nuremberg, he was one of the leading liberal jurists on the bench. He had been on the bench for about 10 years by then. He came on in, um, in 41, and he went to Nuremberg in, four, in, um, in 45, and of course he was on the court till 54. He died en route to the court um, in, in a here oral argument. He had still participated in Brown versus Board of Education, unanimous opinion. That, that struck down uh, compulsory segregation by race in the public schools. He had been one of the leading liberals prior to going to Nuremberg. He usually voted with Black and Douglas and Murphy and Lutledge, and that was five votes. Versus normally, I mean, I'm, over, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but generally speaking, that was the lineup. On the other side, you would usually have Frankfurter and Harlan and Reed and Roberts and some of the others. Anyway, he went to Nuremberg with the nomenclature of someone who would have been classified as one of the leading liberals on the bench. Nuremberg changed that to a considerable extent. He did not become illiberal by any means, but he recognized during his tenure as our chief prosecutor in Nuremberg that one of the reasons why, at least in his judgment, and I certainly would join that, one of the reasons why the famous or unhappy Weimar Republic in Germany failed and brought about, of course, ultimately the Hitler regime was because the Weimar administration, the government of Germany, did not sufficiently clamp down on subversive activities. It did nothing to stop either the rise of the fascists or the communists. And ultimately, the government, of course, was destroyed. And it led, as I said before, uh, by a number of other administrations to the, to the regime. He became convinced that uh, governments cannot allow themselves the luxury of permitting any kind of subversive activity merely under the aegis of freedom of expression or freedom of movement. And so when he came home from Nuremberg, um, Victoriously, of course, and being the author of the code that is now being applied <coughs> around the world, uh, we have a new court, the Court of Human Rights, for example, in uh, uh, sitting in uh, one is in, uh, uh, in in The Hague, and we have one in Strasbourg. When he came home, his jurisprudence reflected his conviction that there must be some lines, there must be some limits drawn even in a totally free society. And so his votes became more cautious, and he could no longer be counted upon uh, as a Pavlovian member of the liberal wing of the court. And in one particular case in Chicago, in which he attempted uh, to convince his colleagues that Chicago's uh, police department was correct in attempting to break up a vicious and violent demonstration led by Native American fascist leader by the name of Gerald L.K. Smith. The court ruled five to four, 
that the um, freedom of assembly rights of that particular group, no matter what their allegiance might be, <coughs> had priority. That Chicago had no right under its ordinance to apprehend and incarcerate the perpetrators. He wrote a dissenting opinion, which I would regard as one of his major landmarks, and it is a landmark which illustrates how his mind had changed in terms of governmental power and authority. And he concluded his dissenting opinion by saying, unless this court provides a little more common sense, it will convert the Constitutional Bill of Rights into a suicide pact. Uh, it's a statement that I'm going to repeat pretty soon because I have to participate in a, um, a presentation which deals with the question, and we're going to be f facing this sooner or later, we've already had with the question of, of what is the position of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of expression generally in times of war? To what extent must the government take cognizance of the fact that certain activities must at least be given close attention? It should be an interesting panel uh, but I'm prepared to quote Justice Jackson, at least in terms of one of the, the key aspects of the issue. There have to be some limits. It's very difficult to provide these, and he wrestled with it. But as I say, the, his experiences at Nuremberg prompted him to reconsider his earlier stand. He still would be regarded as a liberal jurist. I certainly would give him that nomenclature. But he had become cautious and he recognized that even a totally free society is entitled to have law and order because without law and order, he said, freedom will perish, and then there would be nothing left. So uh, he might not have been listed as a, a great justice, qua justice, but he certainly was a great human being, and he was a highly significant member of the legal fraternity. He was a lawyer's lawyer in many ways. That's what some people called him. And he, of course, was a, an amazing public servant. He never finished law school. He never went to Albany Law School. He was so bored that he decided not to finish it. He was one of three who didn't finish law school. They were the last three who didn't finish law school, but of course became lawyers anyway, who, who reached the Supreme Court. There were Justice Reed of Kentucky, uh, Justice Jackson, of New York, and the last one who was miserable on the court and lasted exactly a year and a half, and then he was happy to step down to, to become a President Roosevelt, as Roosevelt called him, assistant for domestic affairs. That was Jimmy Burns, you know, who of course had been a senator, as you know, and later on became governor of uh, South Carolina and lived to be close to be 100. He too had not finished law school. Incidentally, as you know, one doesn't have to be a lawyer to be on the Supreme Court of the United States or on any of the federal benches. There's nothing in law and nothing in the Constitution that requires you to be an attorney. Uh, but of course, we've never had a member of the court, of the Supreme Court, who was not an attorney, you couldn't get through the uh, committees. Now, the states are different. In many states, you must be a lawyer in order to become a member of the uh, of the courts. But uh, Jackson, as I said, was so bored and he didn't think he needed law school and he finished and of course became one of America's outstanding lawyers, held any number of positions and was appointed by FDR, who was his close friend, first as Assistant Solicitor General, then as Solicitor General. He did a wonderful job, such a good job that Justice Brandeis said, Bob Jackson ought to be Solicitor General of the United States for life. Um, well. Uh, that would have been too bad if he had done that for the rest of his life, but it's a very important position. And it used to be a conduit towards the um, Supreme Court. A good many solicitors general went mm -hmm. on. And Reed was one and Jackson was <coughs> one. We have one now who theoretically might be in line, except that he has his, his um, particular political affiliation for probably to cause some problems. And that is uh, Theodore Olson who will argue in a brief amicus coy for the government uh, in the Michigan case, coming up the affirmative action case. Theodore Olson uh, is a splendid orator, and he is the husband of Barbara Olson, who was killed in the, uh, in the, uh, it, it was the Pentagon plane when she went down. 
she still reached him by a cell phone. In any event, uh, Bob Jackson was at the pinnacle of his career when he worked for the administration, and yet there was much more to come. He uh, was uh, ready to be appointed to the Supreme Court, and when uh, Justice uh, Yu stepped down, uh, everyone expected Justice Jackson, who was then Attorney General, to be appointed to the Supreme Court. And uh, Jackson expected it, and Roosevelt had often <coughs> talked to him about it. And uh, Jackson hoped, of course, not only to be on the Supreme Court, he wanted to be Chief Justice. But uh, it was wartime by then, and uh, Roosevelt, yielded, yielding to advice, and he, he sought the opinion of Felix Frankfurter, who was on the court, Roosevelt concluded that while he wanted Bob Jackson, and he said, Bob, your time will come, uh, he thought it was important in the interest of national unity to appoint as Chief Justice the only Republican who was on the Supreme Court at the time, and that was, of course, uh, Stone, <laughs> wonderful Jewish from New York. He was a Republican, but he was a very liberal Republican, and usually voted with the liberals on the bench. But Jackson's time would come, and when it came, he went on the court, and uh, that was in 1941. It was only four years until the end of the war, and then the rest, of course, is history. But I think perhaps you can glean now why those who ranked and rated uh, Supreme Court justices purely on the basis of their membership on the bench might have felt that in view of some of the problems he experienced, in view of the feud with Black, in view of, of his Nuremberg absence, uh, it might not perhaps be deserving to to accord him the title of a great jurist. He was a great jurist. Perhaps he was not a great Supreme Court justice because even the defense did not allow him to become one. But he was a great figure on the American scene and um, it is certainly appropriate that you have proceeded to honor him in the magnificent <coughs> fashion in which you have because he deserves well of the Republic and he will always be remembered not only for what he did and for what he was, but for what he wrote and how he wrote it. Well, thank you very much. Always on behalf of the Jackson Center, I'd love to grab the notes that he had, the people have, so we can put them for the archives. There are no notes. <laughs> <laughs> there were plenty of notes last night. Well, right, golly. That, so. So, this is off the top of the head. Uh, professor Abraham, being a good professor, encouraged me to make sure that if you had any questions, make sure to ask him, because he's, uh, among a variety of things, he talked about the Michigan case, he will be, he's already got the tickets to attend that case uh, as he gets up close and personal to the Supreme Court arguments. Uh, he's one of those rare individuals who has an in with the court and in with the clerks, and if you've ever read his book, which frankly I was hoping to have the copies, Justice, Presidents, and Senators here. Uh, we sold them all out last night, so I apologize for not having <laughs> anticipated a lot more so we could have had them here. Uh, but if anybody has any questions on, on a variety of subjects uh, of Justice Abraham, sure. Is longevity a requirement for greatness? Is Jefferson a requirement? No. Longevity. longevity. Or longevity. You, you seem to indicate that because of his short duration on the court that he didn't have a chance to become great. Well, it should not be a requirement for greatness. Uh, one of the 12 was always listed um, was Benjamin Cardozo, who of course was one of the great human beings and great jurists um, in America. I did not missed him, despite the fact that I've always been in love with Cardozo's writing, and uh, despite the fact that he graced New York's benches for 24 years and was an incredible human being. But I thought that five and a half years, unfortunately a stroke fell him after five and a half years, I thought that was not enough time. Uh, perhaps I was wrong, and, and no, not, not many followed my, my particular approach to Cardozo. But I think you can make a case for saying that a short period of time on the court would not provide sufficient uh, evidence, if you please, or background to establish someone as
as having both feet in the great category. I think it is an arbitrary kind of approach, and uh, I, I don't pay much credence to the fact that Jackson only had 13 years, but it was a stormy period, and uh, he and Black had a very nasty public battle, and um, uh, Black did much better than Jackson did with the press, and of course, uh, during the Nuremberg period, Black was at home and Jackson was away. And the enmity also dealt with certain kinds of cases. Uh, there was one famous case in particular when they were at each other's throat, and the fact that they both thought they were going to be chief and neither one became also exacerbated the controversy. But you're quite right, a mere length of time should not be decisive. On the other hand, if you've only had four or five years, and even if you wrote all the opinions that you expected to write, an average, I would say, of, um, at the moment, 10, 15 a year, uh, that isn't a great many opinions. Now, Bob Jackson wrote 300 opinions. <laughs> and if you divide that by 13, well, you know, you get about the number I've indicated. Some justices uh, just won't write that many opinions. Justice uh, Van der Vanter, for example, who was excellent, an excellent administrator and helped Justice Taft a lot with Taft's chores. Taft was primarily an administrative chief justice. He, uh, Van der Vanter wrote only one and a half opinions a year, and he got away with it because he did a great deal of work on the court. But uh, Justice Whitaker, who was an Eisenhower appointee, was on the bench for less than six years and is listed as one of the six or seven failures among the court uh, critiques. Whitaker uh, was so unhappy in writing opinions that he just couldn't do them. And an example of that uh, was, I mentioned that last night at, at dinner, uh, Whitaker had, had, had suffered a nervous breakdown on the court and apparently had recovered from that. He just couldn't handle the responsibility despite the fact that he had served on lower courts and was a very significant uh, executive in the world of, uh, uh, in the corporate world, Whitaker uh, just wouldn't write any opinions at the end. And Chief Justice Warren, who was chief at the time, in one particular case, told him, now he said, Chuck, you've got to write this opinion. It's an easy one. There are only two dissenters. The court will be seven to two. You've got to write it. All right, Whitaker. I got this information from Justice Douglas's books. Now, Justice Douglas had a pension for uh, pay, paying not too much attention to the truth when it suited him. <laughs> One might say that he lied on occasion. But in, in any event, uh, this, I, I have no doubt, it, uh, I, know, you know, I have no occasion to doubt this story. Justice Whittaker came to him with that particular case that I mentioned and said, uh, Bill, I can't write this. I said, would you help me? Douglas was a very facile writer. He would sit up on the bench while the other justices were listening to oral argument, and he would work on a book, you see. <laughs> anyway, Douglas looked at him and said, hey, he said, Chuck, I, I'm going to dissent in that case. In fact, I've written the dissenting opinion. He said, I can't write your majority opinion. And Whittaker said, well, I really need some help, and you can give me that help. And Douglas said, well, OK, come back in half an hour. And I'll draft something for you. And he came back half an hour later, and uh, Bill Douglas had written the opinion, the majority opinion. And this was the only time in the history of the court that a Supreme Court justice wrote both the majority opinion <laughs> and the <laughs> so, uh, As I say, I can't vouch for the truth of that. And there's a new book published by an ex student of mine. The book is called Wild Bill. It depicts the life and times of Justice Douglas, much of which was spent in the boudoirs of women. <laughs> and, uh, it's a pretty scatological story, but uh, it's fun to read. In any event, it's, it's, much, it's too much fun. There's 716 pages. <laughs> and there's certain sameness of Justice Douglas' conquests, you see. Of course, the last time he uh, was married, that was for the fourth time. Uh, he married a 22-year-old woman. He was 72. And uh, the Congress uh, in the House of Representatives, they submitted impeachment resolutions, you see. Uh, but of course, that didn't get anywhere. Uh, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee 
of Brooklyn's Manny Seller buried them, and Justice Douglas, who was, I mean, Justice Black, who was Douglas's friend, although not without some criticism, sent him a note and said, Bill, if they impeach you, or try to impeach you, I have one more good fight left in me. I'm going to defend you. I'll be your lawyer. You see, that, was, that wasn't necessary. He was willing to step down from the bench. And they are fascinating people up there. They really are, and there's some wonderful ones, and, um, and some are not so wonderful. But on the whole, I would say that uh, James Madison's wish that um, uh, the court be happily filled has come true. I would be quite willing, as an old teacher, to give the court generally at least a B plus and maybe an A minus for its activities. Uh, there are some that shouldn't have been on the court, but on the whole, Mount Olympus, as Holmes called it, you know, um, is, a, is a, a wonderful institution which brings out the best in most members on the bench. Sometimes it brings out the worst, too. But uh, this is a good court. The current court is a, is a very good court. Most of the very liberal law professors don't like it, but uh, uh, they're evenly balanced. Uh, they have a very interesting center, headed by Justice O'Connor, who's going to be the key in the Michigan affirmative action case. And it'll be interesting to see whether she will do anything about her great friend and mentor, Justice Lewis Powell's opinion in the Bakke case, which established, of course, the concept of a plus for race. In that case, uh, it was a five to four decision. Justice Powell, for the court, declared unconstitutional rigid racial quotas, but said in the second part of the opinion in Bakke two that race could be a factor, it could be a plus, provided it was not the only consideration. Uh, of course, what we have seen is it has become a major consideration in most colleges and universities, and that is why the Michigan case is here. Uh, the interesting question will be, is undoubtedly Justice O'Connor is going to hold the decision here, because you have four sure votes. Predicting the court is absurd, because you cannot predict the court, except sometimes you can. There are four sure votes to uphold the notion, the concept of affirmative action. That is Justice Stevens, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Souter, and Justice Breyer. That's a solid four, and arguing counsel won't have to bother talking to them very much. On the other side, you have three sure votes anyway. You have the chief. Chief is not going to vote for affirmative action. Justice Scalia is not, and Justice Thomas is not. In fact, Justice Thomas's opinions always present a complete rejection of utilizing race. He considers it insulting to have race provided as a particular plus. So those are three votes who are going to vote to strike it down. That leaves the two centrist justices, Kennedy and O'Connor. Now, Justice Kennedy is leaning against affirmative action. Justice O'Connor has written most of the recent opinions in which affirmative action has been um, attacked. But she always left the door open. She has never been willing to say that you cannot consider race along the same lines as, for example, legacy or basketball scholarships or, or location or what have you. So, but she's insisted repeatedly, and she has written most of the opinions in the so-called majority-minority district cases, when uh, the congressional districts and state districts have been aligned and organized in accordance where people lived, you know. And some of these districts, especially in the South, are incredible, you know, where they snake around and picking up uh, <coughs> pockets of, uh, of African Americans in various parts of the state. Well, she has headed the court, has usually been five to four, with Justice Thomas always saying race can never be considered. But uh, she has not been willing to say you can never consider it, but she's always said it cannot become the predominant factor in the decision making. So the question will arise in my mind, as well as that of all other people who are going to be listening there, will she be willing 
to strike down the Michigan situation, or will, will, will she be willing to find, as her great friend and mentor, Justice Lewis Howell, will she find an area in which race could be considered a plus? A specific area in the Michigan case is the concept of diversity. See, on the notion of diversity stands at the center of the whole argument, namely the desirability of providing diversity on college and university campuses. Well, uh, that's an interesting question, uh, but um, how far do you go? The, con the constitutional concept that enters here is the answer to the question, is diversity a compelling state interest in framing legislation, in framing admission standards? Uh, is that concept of diversity so significant that it becomes a compelling state interest? Not just the state interest, but a compelling state interest. Now you bring many interpretations to the notion of compelling, you see. And I think it is there that she will focus. And she may well find that it may not be compelling, but it may be quasi or crypto or proto compelling. <laughs> because I just don't see that she wants to go down in history as the person who struck down affirmative action. Not that the universities would pay much attention anyway. You know, they have a whole number of ways of getting around it. But I think you have to, and the lawyers are going to address her, and she will like it. And I'm sure, I, I shouldn't say I'm sure, for goodness sake, how can I say that? But I would be surprised if she is not going to write the opinion. Of course, that depends a little bit on the lineup, but it's so closely split, four to four, that uh, so watch her and watch the opinion. It's not going to come down immediately. It, it is one of those cases that Justice Holmes always called the trouble cases. And the court saves the trouble cases for their last session of the year, usually at the end of June or early July, and then they can run away, you see. So <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Tell me about Paul Newman, just, just for the girls here. There's not too much I can tell. I was in his room only for three weeks, you see, but I was a student, and Paul's major was a study of anatomy, you see. And I was a 26-year-old guy who hadn't finished college, and uh, I just couldn't handle that. Also, what he did on my psyche was horrendous. <laughs> there was no competition there, so uh, uh, he, was a, he was an economics major, a good student when he wanted to be, and uh, a wonderfully loyal friend of the college. He's, he and Joan Woodward have given millions and millions to the school and, and headed a number of the fund drives, and, and all the income from his sources and uh, popcorn and other horrible things, all that income. <laughs> goes to a foundation named for his son Scott, who killed himself with drugs and alcohol at the age of 25 or 26 in Hollywood, thinking he could become like his father by doing nothing, you see. So his father was always a hard worker and uh, played in every play in Canyon he would find. It didn't matter whether it was King Lear or Willie Loman, he was always played. And he got his start through a wonderful raven-haired Broadway actor. Some of you, I think, are old enough to remember her. My students, of course, when I mentioned the name, never knew what I was talking about. It was Catherine Cornell. Oh. She saw him play oh. and took him to Cleveland to the Playhouse. And she gave him his start. He saw to it that she got an honorary degree at Kenyon, and so did her husband, Delphine McClendon. And Catherine Cornell was the only woman I ever knew in Paul's orbit who was interested in him other than carnally. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Professor Abraham. I certainly enjoyed that. And uh, it's always a pleasure for me, I know for uh, great rap uh, of our faculty members, assistant is uh, both the science to, to be in the presence of a great future. And I certainly uh, envy the uncertain uh, the hundreds of thousands of students that uh, you've had over the years and have enjoyed um, not only your, your, your 
in-depth expertise and knowledge of the subject, but your, your wonderful uh, uh, presentation style, the way you communicate uh, with, with the group. And we certainly are honored to have you with us. And Greg, again, we thank you and the Jackson Center for uh, having Professor Abraham with us today. I would like to announce uh, that April 11th uh, will be our next round table. And our guest will be Thomas Finger of the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. State Department uh, discussing challenges. Um, certainly, uh, Mr. Finger will be able to bring some, uh, some light uh, to us about some of the, the implications of that war upon the U.S. Uh, around the world. Um, and as we conclude, and if I'm not asking too much, uh, maybe it would be appropriate to uh, have a moment of silence and uh, to, to wish those who may be uh, about to place their lives uh, on the line um, for us and for our country uh, to wish them well. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day.